You're listening to the Blue Angel Phantoms podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Notop, and I interview former Blue Angel pilots and crew, and I'm really excited to be delivering this episode to you today because my guest is currently a major in the Marine Corps Reserves, a graduate of the U.S. Naval Academy, has flown combat missions over Afghanistan and Uganda, and was a pilot for the Blue Angel C-130 Fat Albert during the 2015 and 2016 air show seasons. That's right. My guest is Major Katie Cook, and we had an incredibly candid conversation where she provides insight into a number of topics, including sharing a pretty intense story that led to her to choose a C-130 Hercules as her platform of choice over the F-18 Hornet. She also recalls a combat mission over Afghanistan that she considers one of the proudest moments in her career. Later on in the podcast, Major Cook details her time on the Blue Angels, including the training regiment for Fat Albert pilots and what it feels like to fly zero-G maneuvers. And finally, she opens up about the terrible loss of her good friend and fellow Marine, Captain Jeff Coos. All this and more, so if you're a fan of the Blue Angels and Blue Angels history, then please stick around and join me in welcoming Major Katie Cook to the podcast. Major Katie Cook, thank you so much for joining me here on the Blue Angel Phantoms podcast. I know that my audience is pretty vocal with me about who they would like me to interview, and your name is pretty much always at the top of my emails or DMs, (laughs) so (laughs) I appreciate you taking time to chat with me today. Sure thing. It's my pleasure. Thanks for reaching out. Oh, of course. Now, you come from a fantastic legacy that's been really well documented uh, with both your grandfather and your father being military aviators. Uh, Did this legacy, and I'd have to assume this legacy, really led to your own interest in aviation and the eventual career choice you made in life? Am am I right? Um, I would say yes. It, it, It definitely was my family's influence for sure. I wasn't dead set on being in the military or being a pilot probably until I was in high school. But my grandfather, who is a Swedish immigrant, his family came over. So he was a first generation American. He really instilled this idea of service in in my life, in my brother's life and in my cousin's. This idea of giving back to a country that had given so much to us because they, my family literally showed up with nothing, you know, and, and moved to upper middle class in basically two generations because of the military and because of this great country and the opportunities that we were provided. And so I didn't know if I wanted to be, you know, a firefighter, a police officer. I even considered the nunnery at one point, but I know I wanted to have kids and I tend to frown upon that. Um, but ultimately I landed on the military. Um, and then once I made that decision, I knew that aviation was kind of the path for me. My uncles, my grandfathers, and, and my father as well were all aviators. So if I was going to be in the military, I was going to be in the sky. And so your grandfather was actually in the Army Air Corps during World War II. Yep, both of them were actually my maternal and paternal. were both in the Army Air Corps in, uh, in World War II. Um, one retired as a colonel, one as a lieutenant colonel. So they stayed in and as the Air Force came about as well. So they retired from the Air Force, yep. And your dad was a naval aviator. He flew F-18s. He did, yep, that's true. And he retired after 26 years when I was a midshipman. So you come from a military family. I assume you moved around a lot. I know my wife, her father was in the Army. She's lived all over the place. Did you move around a lot as a kid? Yes, very much. Um, So I was born in Jacksonville, Florida, moved to Lemoore, California, Newport, Rhode Island, Satellite Beach, Florida, then uh, back to Lemoore, California. I lived in Yokosuka, Japan, the Northern Virginia area when my dad was at the Pentagon. And then that's just as a child. And then, of course, I moved around my own career. So, yeah, we moved, we moved quite often. And then on top of that, you decide to apply to the U.S. Naval Academy, which is no small feat because the academic requirements are quite rigorous. And on top of that, you actually have to secure the nomination of a member of Congress to actually be admitted. All that, and you're moving around, which makes being academic probably quite challenging and then not established in any one community because you are moving. It must be hard to secure a member, uh, a nomination from a member of Congress. How did you fare? How did you do it? Yeah. Uh, So I was a bit of a nerd. I did do sports and stuff, which kind of makes you well-rounded applicant for the Naval Academy. Um, But I, I was I was valedictorian in my class kind of thing. So I I was kind of nerdy. Um, But as far as getting the nomination, it's very similar to applying to a college. It's an application that you submit through your congressman. Um, And, you know, military brats, if you will, uh, are are pretty well known in this process. There are a lot of legacies, if you will, kids applying whose parents went like like me. And so my my parents um, voted in Florida. They were Florida residents. And so that's where I applied via my 
nomination for both my congressman and my senator, and I got both, both the senator from Florida and, and Congress um, when I applied for the Naval Academy. So it is a very robust process. And I remember flying down because I lived in Northern Virginia, but my parents, since they voted in Florida, that's where I was applying. I, I flew down for the day, went to Disney because that's where they were doing the interviews did the interview and flew back so that I wouldn't miss any school. And I was like a high school junior or senior. So it was a busy day. I still remember it, but um, it was cool. I ended up getting both nominations and being able to meet some of my classmates at the awarding ceremony was, was cool because it was before we went. So I kind of already had friends or at least connections before I showed up to the Academy. Nice. And my own father is a Naval Academy graduate that also chose to go to the Marines like you and nice. Uh, yeah, the the Naval Academy isn't like your standard college. It's very structured. It's very rigorous. It's uh, not a lot of free time. Did you have a hard time adjusting to that type of lifestyle, or were you used to it? Given the fact you grew up in a military family, um, I would say the like academics being hard for me was an adjustment because I had breezed through school. Um, so being challenged there was a little bit hard. But the the schedule. Um, the, you know, wake up at this time, have your room made, all that stuff. That wasn't an issue. And I actually think it made me a better person because I, I went there at 17 years old, as you can imagine. You know, I, I didn't really know what I wanted out of life and having someone tell me what to do um, in that structure was probably better if I had gone off to some normal school and I probably would have, you know, not, not have been as successful because I wouldn't have had as much guidance. And one thing you actually have the option of doing when you graduate the Naval Academy is you can either go to the Navy or you can go to the Marines. And you chose the Marines, which is a bit surprising because your father was an F-18 pilot in the Navy. What drove your decision? Yeah, I'm actually the only Marine in my whole family. Um, My brother actually went to the Naval Academy two years after me. Um, And so everyone went Navy but me. And then obviously my grandfathers were Army Air Corps and Air Force. And so I'm the lone Marine, but... It ultimately, when I was in training at the Naval Academy, I got exposed to a, a bunch of enlisted Marines uh, during my summer training. And I was just so impressed with their professionalism, with their knowledge, um, with their you know subject matter expertise. And I wanted to lead people like that. And I'm not saying that the Navy doesn't have that personnel, but these individuals made such an impact on me at a, at a very influential time in my life that I was like, you know what, that's that's for me. And, and then the ideals that the Marine Corps stands for and embodies, that's something that I wanted to, to do with my life. And, and it ultimately worked out. And the natural progression from someone that chooses to become a Marine is they go to Quantico, Virginia, to the basic school. Is that your journey or did you take a slightly different path? I actually went to grad school first I uh, because I was nerdy. <laughs> um, got good enough grades at the academy where they let me go to Georgetown. Um, so I got my master's there. Once I wrapped that up, then I went to the basic school and then down to flight school. And you knew at a young age, you obviously wanted to be involved in aviation. But once you did join the Marines, how much were you able to influence that decision to be able to be a Marine aviator? Yeah, what's great at the Naval Academy is um, when you put in your selections or your requesting of what you do when you graduate, you put that down. So I put like Marine Air first and then Marine Ground, then Navy Air. Um, and then I think I put slow or something like that after that. But um, but yeah, so you are selected as an air contract out of the Naval Academy. So I knew pending, I made it through TBS and, um, that I would be going to flight school at the end. And going into flight school, did you know what airplane you wanted to fly? You obviously ended up with the C-130, but did you want to fly F-18 Hornets like your father or did you know you wanted to be a C-130 pilot? No, I was, I was F-18's hardcore going in there. Um, and then things happen and it changes your perspective. And, you know, I ended up in the C-130 and ended up being the best thing to happen to me for sure. And how did that transition work from wanting to fly F-18s to ending up with the C-130 as your platform? Yeah. So, um, the, there was an incident in flight school that, um, I've talked about in some interviews, but I was in formations, which is they're teaching you to fly with another airplane. And we ended up in some weather and I had not been in instruments so I had no idea how to program in, you know, any anything in the, I don't know how to get like nerdy on you, but I didn't know how to do an ILS. I didn't know how to make the aircraft do any instrument approaches. So my instructor had to take the controls and we were in lead and my, uh, my classmate was our wingman and we got, ended up getting disoriented in the clouds. Um, he was, 
I could see all the screens flipping and I was looking outside because I didn't know any better. And all of a sudden I heard the airplane getting loud. I had, I had actually almost oversped the airplane in aerobatics. So I knew what loud sounded like, like overspeeding. And I looked down and I see this our, our knots going like 300, 310, 320 and it, and it overspeeds, you know, right at 320. And so as I was saying, sir, like over the box to get his attention, um, we break out of the clouds and all I see are trees. Thank God I was looking outside. My instructor was looking inside um, because I grabbed the stick, pulled it to my stomach and actually grayed out my instructor, pulled as hard as I could, ended up pulling 7.6 Gs and over Gene the airplane. And my wingman followed right along with me. Um, the instructor was flying, so awesome, awesome pilot. Um, we ended up pulling the black box off of their airplane, and we got down to 50 feet by the time we recovered because every, everyone had just gotten disoriented. So it was, it was really scary. And at that point, I was like, screw this. I'm not, I'm not going to – I don't want to go fast. I want to give gas. And I, you know, and part of me, my heart hurt bad because I, I really wanted to do close air support. That's what my dad did. That's what I wanted to do. And so I was like, you know what, I'll just, I won't be the tip of the spear. I'll be like just a little bit back and support those guys. So because I had angled for jets, basically all of flight school, I had pretty good grades. And that's ultimately how you pick your platform is we have something called a Naval Standard Score or an NSS is what we call it. And depending on what your score is or what you're qualified for. So jets, you have to have a really high score of like 65 out of 80 or higher. And then, you know, C-130s, I think is like 50 or higher and helicopters are like 35 or higher, whatever it is. And so I had my choice of what I wanted, but I put C-130s first. We only select about 12 a year um, out of flight school. And so it's very, very competitive to get C-130s. Ultimately, I got one of those spots, which is great. Um, and then just as a caveat, I ended up doing close air support on the Harvest Hawk in my career. So everything kind of worked out for a reason. So I was, I was really happy with it. And how hard was it for you to transition from an F-18 Hornet to a C-130? I assume it's a completely different animal. So actually, I was in primary, so there's several parts to flight school. So aviation pre-indoctrination, API is what we call it, is all in the classroom. Everyone goes through that, um, and it's about six weeks long. Once you complete that, you go to primary. Everyone goes through that. That's the T6 Texan, and that's where you'll pick your platform. So at that point, it was no different flying F-18s or C-130s. The pass wasn't because we were all still in, in the Texan. Then once you move on from there... You'll go down your pipeline. So, you know, jets will fly the T-45. The T-57 is what the helicopter guys fly. We fly the T-44 in multi-engine. And then after that is when you wing and then you go on to your own aircraft. So I hadn't committed, if you will, down the pipeline to jets yet when I made the switch. So it wasn't too big of a deal. And the C-130, such a big plane. Do you remember the first time that you got to command a flight from start to finish, uh, from takeoff to landing? I would assume that that would be a pretty big milestone in your career. And my thought would be that'd be really nerve wracking to command such a flight for the first time. Do you remember that? In the C-130, because we're a crew aircraft, so we have two pilots and, and a flight engineer or a crew master, if you will, you never are alone in the airplane, right? But as a, we, we have a progression. So 3P is brand new in the airplane. You can't fly basically without a very experienced um, aircraft commander with you. Then you, after a hundred hours or so, you move from 3P to 2P. 2P, you can fly with like a pretty junior aircraft commander. You're preparing yourself to move up and be an aircraft commander. And then obviously, ultimately, aircraft commander is, is the qual that you want. And then after that, it's a, all your instructor qualifications. So aircraft commander is the one that you're really trying to get to. So I do remember my first 3P flight, but I was like so far behind the airplane that I was like holding onto the tail, if you will. <laughs> so the one that's most memorable is what we call our cherry flight when I was the aircraft commander for the first time. And, and that was such a cool experience. And I was actually deploying like literally the next day. Um, and so it, it was like, hey, get the cherry flight done. Okay, you're deploying and taking taking your skills as an aircraft commander um, overseas. And so that was really cool experience. And great segue. So you've deployed a lot of places, Afghanistan, and I believe it was at Uganda as well. Or yep. Yeah. I mean, uh, so you've served in these pretty extreme regions, obviously, where there's conflict. Are, what's the type of missions? What's the standard type of mission that you are deploying when you're in combat? In a C-130, so, I should say. Yeah. So that's what's 
so beautiful about the C-130 community um, that I always stress when people ask me about it is, uh, you know, our, our jet brethren tend to focus on air-to-air combat, close air support, while the C-130, particularly when I was in Afghanistan, you could wake up and do five dis- different missions in one day. You know, we, we did do close air support using our, our Harvest Hawk platform that I talked about. It has Hellfire and Griffin missiles on it. Um, we also did, obviously, tanking was our main mission there. We moved cargo. We dropped battlefield illumination. So it's basically like a really bright, bright flare that lights up the battlefield so that our guys on the ground can see what they're doing. Um, we also dropped, like, leaflets. So it's to the people um, to say, like, hey, evacuate this area. There's going to be an attack. Or, hey, if you have information on bad guys, please go tell these people. Um, we also dropped cargo out, like, via a parachute, dropped people out via a parachute. Um, and so there's all these different kinds of missions. And then when I was in Uganda, um, we actually were on standby to evacuate the embassy out of South Sudan. So I ended up doing that in early January of 2014. Um, and so it was really neat because I literally went from Afghanistan, came home, upgraded aircraft commander for three months, and then deployed again. So I was in a predominantly offensive, you know, close air support, taking the fight to the enemy deployment. And then I was on a humanitarian deployment. So to see both sides of the Marine Corps and the, you know, vast expanse of mission sets that we do uh, in such a short time was such a great experience. And it, and it shaped me, you know, as a pilot and, and as, a, as a leader to be able to see, you know, that, that experience. And there's a great video online narrated by Harrison Ford, where he describes w- what is one of the proudest moments of your career when you were on a mission in Afghanistan and you heard a call out over the radio from Marines on the ground needing air cover and assistance. Can you share that story from your perspective? Sure. So um, as I referenced a couple of times, the Harvest Hawk is, is a normal C-130, but it's got a roll on roll off capability of basically one of our fueling pods on the left side, they remove and put on a four, four by hellfire. And then we have a modified door in the back that can shoot out Griffin missile. So it, I, I actually was not scheduled to go on the Afghanistan deployment. One of our pilots ended up a heart murmur like six weeks before we were going. They need somebody to fill in. Hey, Katie, we need you to go. And so it, it was like fast and furious trying to get all my qualifications because we call it pre-deployment training. You want to do all of the practice flights before you get over there. You don't want the first time that you do something in country, right? Well, we were so far behind, I was, because it was a last minute deployment that I had never done a live fire before with the with the Harvest Hawk. I had done practice flights, but never seen a missile come off the rails, if you will. So I get in country. Um, my very first flight, we're uh, overhead in, in the stack, as they call it. So you're basically in an orbit with a bunch of other airplanes. And all of a sudden we get a tick, which is a troops in contact. Um, that's the most severe one. And, and we're talking to the controller on the ground. We call them JTACs or FACs. Um, we, we're talking to the JTAC on the ground and you can hear on the radio, the like tick, 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 tick of the rounds like hitting behind him. And he's saying, hey, we're pinned down by a PKM team, uh, which is a machine gun. There's three guys on top of a building. And so we're in the orbit and he gives us a nine line, which is basically instructions on how to fly the attack so that you don't shoot friendly people. Um, and it tells you where the closest forces are, where the bad guys are, what type of munitions they want you to use, that kind of thing. So I remember there being terrain, there was clouds, and now this is the first time I'm going to shoot. And, and it's, it's not like um, some of our other missions, which were basically employing against bad guys. So it was just like finding a bad guy and, and by firing the missile. This one was like, people are going to die if we don't, you know, do something. And so... Um, my heart was racing and I knew I, I couldn't fail. And I remember, you know, turning in for the attack heading, we fired two by hellfire and then it was like dead silence. And so you're just like waiting, you know, cause the JTAC is supposed to give you feedback on your shots. Right. And, and so you're waiting, 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 waiting. And finally comes back and he's like, okay, we're good. Thanks so much. Blah, blah, blah. And you're just like, huh. and it's, and, and you know, you're, you're shaking because you have so much adrenaline for me. It was the first time that I had, shot it's it was definitely a crazy experience and then fast forward in the story that Harrison Ford talks about is uh I was in a bar in Spain on my second deployment right before I went into Uganda and somebody came up behind me and said hey were you filth zero two in Afghanistan which was my call sign in Afghanistan 
And I said, I, I was. And he said, I recognize your voice. And this is pretty common for women pilots, especially um, where I was in RC Southwest and near Kandahar area um, and, and Hellman province, because there's not very many women pilots. There were no other women on the Harvest Hawk at the time when I was there. And so everyone kind of knew my voice. So he had heard it on the radio. And uh, I was like, oh, that's cool. And he's like, do you remember this time there's a PKM team pinning down this? And so he starts literally giving me the same description that I just gave you. And he's like, I was that JTAC on the ground. We were talking to you guys. You guys saved our life. And so I still, every time I tell this story, and I've told it, as you can imagine, multiple times, but I still get goosebumps because I joined the Marine Corps. I joined Marine Air to support those guys on the ground to make sure that they go home to their families. And to be able to know that I achieved that mission, put a face with that, you know, accomplishment is something that I'm so proud of. And, you know, I've had a really neat career, but I will always reflect back on that experience as, as my most proud moment. And I've seen the video and I still have goosebumps sitting here listening to you talk about it, but transitioning here, you actually made a decision at some point to apply for the Blue Angels. How did that come to be? (laughs) So I actually was in Africa. Um, I was in a hotel in Uganda. There was not enough ramp space in Djibouti. That's where the rest of my detachment was. And so it was like me and 10 people just hanging out in Uganda. And I get a call from the M3 at the time, who was Dusty Cook. He sort of knew of me. Um, We were in 252, but he was deployed while I was home. And then literally he got home and I deployed. So I overlapped with him. I think I flew with him one sim or something. Um, So I didn't know him very well, but he had heard of my reputation through the grapevine. And because I had deployed back to back, I had gotten the hours that I needed to, to be even eligible to apply for the blues. So he sent me an email while I was in Africa saying like, hey, you know, would you be interested in doing this? They were actually going to possibly send me up to the wing as my next assignment. And I was not super stoked about doing that. I wanted to stay flying as much as possible. And so that's really what appealed to me at the time when Dusty asked me to apply. It was like, well, I get to keep flying and I get to do really cool flying. You know, it wasn't like I get to be famous or or anything like that. It was like, I get to keep flying and I get to do, you know, stuff that I would normally get my wings taken away for. So sure, I'll I'll apply to the Blues. And so I, I was solicited by the members of the team. Awesome. And one of my favorite questions to ask here on the podcast is how did you make the team or how did you learn you made the team? Usually by phone call. Yep. Uh, but what was your story? How did you learn you made the Blue Angels? Yeah. So interestingly enough, the team before me, so for those that don't know, Fat Albert's crew, officer crew, is three three people. In the event that one of the pilots gets sick, we can still do our mission because obviously it takes two. So we have uh, M1, who's the most senior one, M2, and then M3. The year before me, M2 actually left the team for personal reasons. So there were only two pilots, an M1 and an M3. So my year, they actually needed to select two people to fix the rotation to to get back to three pilots. And so the uh, other person, one of the other people who was applying was actually in my squadron, Fireball, Mark Hamilton. So we were both calling in together. I was in his office. Um, and so, and he's much senior to me. He was our opso at the time. I was a captain, he's a major, but we're both, you know, competing. And it was going to be super awkward if one of us got it and one of us didn't because we're literally listening to the other one talking. So we went through finalist week. We get back there. I'm in his office. Mark goes first. So he calls and I hear him talking and blah, blah, blah. And then he's like, oh, great. So I see him. And so I'm like, yay, he got it. And now I'm like, crap, that's like one less spot for me. You know, I'm probably not going to get it. And so I call in talking to Boss Frosh. And he's like, you know, you're very junior in your career. You could easily apply again, you know, build up those flight hours, get those flight calls or whatever. And so I thought he was like trying to let me down easy. And I was like, okay, sir, well, thanks. And he's like, oh, and one more thing, you know, welcome to the team, asshole. And I was like, oh, I I actually said, and pardon my French, I said, holy shit, was my like first response. And so Mark is in the room. So he starts laughing. And so it ended up being like, you know, a a really great experience for both me and Mark because we were together when we both found out. So, yeah. 
Great story. And I think a lot of people might think that Fat Albert is primarily there for just the demonstration because their only exposure is at an air show where they see Fat Albert perform. But Fat Albert has a completely and entirely other mission to support the Blue Angels. Can you talk about the mission of Fat Albert? Yeah. So Fat Albert is is above all other things, a logistical asset for for the team. Um, so, you know, in when I was there in their 70 year history, now it's several years past that because I'm old and it's been a while, but you know, almost 75 year history on the team, they've never canceled due to maintenance. And that's a huge part due to, to Bert um, because we would do the air shows. And then let's say one of the planes break and they need a part that night we're getting on Bert and we're flying to Oceana. We're flying back to Pensacola, Miramar, wherever we need to go to get the part and coming back so that our maintainers can fix it overnight. So these planes are flying the next day. So if if you ever go to an event at an air show and the Fat Albert crew isn't there, it's that's what they're doing. They're they're doing a parts run or an engine run or something like that to to keep the jet demo going. Um, and that's their their primary mission. And and every show they're moving forty people, all those maintainers, and they're moving about forty five thousand pounds of cargo with them everywhere they go. So I've always wondered that. There's been a number of shows I've gone to throughout my. My time here on this planet where Bert wasn't at the show site or, or performing. So what I'm hearing you say is that it was most likely because Bert was performing a key function for the team outside of the demo. Yeah, exactly. And, and, or, or it's like a crew rest issue. So if we're pretty far away and it takes us, you know, four or five hours to go get the part and come back and we are going to hit our, our crew rest or our crew day issues and it prevents us from doing the demo, that's one reason we wouldn't do it. Um, but the other one is like, yes, it's imperative. You have to go get the part and that overlaps with our showtime or something like that. Or Bert herself has a, has an issue um, and she's broken. That would be the only reason that we would cancel it. I mean, our, our demo is only 10 minutes long or the original demo was only 10 minutes long. So we, we try to do it as much as possible because it's really fun to do. So. <laughs> That's awesome. And I definitely want to ask you more about that. But I want to back up for a second and learn more about the onboarding of a Fat Albert pilot onto the Blue Angel team. Yep. The F-18 pilots have been so well documented about how they joined the team in the year prior to joining. And they shadow the team for a few air shows before the end of the season. Then they go out to winter training and they have a whole regiment there. What does onboarding look like for a Fat Albert pilot? I assume it's a little bit different because you have different missions. But tell me about onboarding as a Fat Albert pilot onto the onto the team. Yeah, so our winter training is not as regimented, I would say, as the Jets in that they have every day they come in and there's a syllabus of what they're going to do. Um, ours was a little bit different. We had to be flexible because, yes, we were running parts. If you think about it, prior to going out to El Centro, they want to get those Jets as pretty as possible, as running as smoothly as possible because it's way more expensive to pull parts out of you know, Jacksonville, Florida, to El Centro than it is to Pensacola. So they want to get these planes as pretty as they can. So we're running those parts. And so we're doing a lot of parts running November, December timeframe. Um, and so we're getting familiar. For me, at least, I was a J baby. So I grew up in the C-130J. That's what I flew. Fat Albert at the time was a C-130T. And so I was building hours in this new, new it's older than the J, but new airplane for me um, to just get familiar with it. Um, learning how to operate as a crew with these new people. So that's kind of what we're doing before we get to El Centro. Once we get to El Centro, it's now more efficient for us to do parts out of Miramar, right? Because that's where the C-130 squadron is. So we actually go and do phase is what we call it, phase maintenance with our BERT uh, for the, about the first month, six weeks of winter training. That means that the pilots, when we're not flying, because it's our airplanes down getting worked at in Miramar, we're in El Centro going out to the comm cart, you know, do, doing a safety observer and, and all that stuff. I, I remember distinctly when they got the uh, like rapid photo uh, ability on the iPhone that I was standing out there for like the solo crosses and like, de -de 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 -de, like taking all the pictures so we could see where they actually hit um, and stuff like that so that we could give them feedback right away when they were practicing these maneuvers. I mean, so I spend a lot of time in the desert is what we say when, when our airplane is down. And then when our airplane is finally good to go, we fly it back to El Centro. And then every day we actually go to Yuma 
which is awesome because it's a, a Marine Corps base and we're around Marines again. But that's where we learn our demo. So we'll go over there for the day, do demo after demo after demo after demo. And you can imagine that ours was even more intense because Dusty was our M1. Mark was our M2. I was M3. Mark and I were both learning the demo at the same time. And so it was it was a lot of repetition. And then obviously our new enlisted crew as well were, were learning. And so ended up learning in Yuma. And then we relocate to El Centro once we're We've got the demo down. We'll do a couple demos in El Centro. We'll learn how to do our remote show profile. So we have two profiles, the one that's like over an airfield and then one that's like over a beach line. So we call it remote and airfield. So we learned the airfield already at Yuma. So then we, when we go back to El Centro is when we start learning the remote profile. And watching Fat Albert is honestly one of my favorite parts of going to an air show. But you guys do some some pretty extreme maneuvers because that, that's a big airplane and it's it's making sharp turns and steep dives and and sharp takeoffs. Uh, are those maneuvers that you use in combat? All of those maneuvers that you see are used in combat maneuvers, whether those are you know things that you do to stay over the airfield to avoid you know m- maybe some hostile forces outside of the airfield perimeter or something like that. Um, so all of those are used in, in combat or in our, in our mission sets like technical navigation or something like that. Um, and so we, we want to show the American people the capability of the C-130 and the abilities of Marine Corps pilots and what these people who are, are deployed overseas, you know, are doing every day. So, so yeah, we, we, we don't do anything more extreme if you will it, everything that we do uh, meets all of the uh, limits and stuff of the airplane but um, we do use them in in normal combat <laughs> yeah i think i would have a significant issue if i was in a commercial airplane and the pilot decided to land the way that fat albert does at <laughs> such an extreme slope yeah but there's incredible footage of online of you flying fat albert uh and i don't know what maneuver it is but at some point you there's essentially zero gravity in the cockpit with the maneuver you're doing. And there is a member of the blue angel sitting behind the pilot and he's able to, to do a forward flip like he's in space and, and land back down oh, uh, on yeah. his butt. Uh, wh- what? Yeah. yeah, exactly. What, what is causing that? What, what maneuver are you doing that is allowing for someone to lose gravity in the cockpit of fat Albert? Yeah. <laughs> So um, that's right after takeoff. So you'll see us, we'll pop off the, we'll get fast enough. We'll pop off the runway, pull up the gear and we go down the runway between three and five feet. We get some airspeed underneath us and then we pitch up really nose high that you see. And then at the peak up there, we, we push over is what we call. uh, And you'll hear the call push over, push over, push over in the videos that you see. And as we're pushing over, that's what causes that zero G uh, maneuver. And so that's when people go waitlist. That's why we have to have everybody, you know, secure their phones and cameras and all that stuff. And we give that safety brief because we've had people get hit in the head and stuff as we go back down. So yeah, it, it was fun. And, and, you know, to, it's the best part because you can actually hear people in the back. We have the noise canceling headphones on, but as you push over, that's everybody in the back's like favorite part because oh, they're, they're floating up and you can hear them like screaming and getting excited and you can actually, it's so loud that you can, you can hear it. And so it's, that, that's pretty fun. And one of the most impressive things about the video I've seen is you're actually flying Fat Albert in the video and the people behind you are going weightless and you're strapped in and, and you don't even look like you're flinching. What does it feel like when you're flying the airplane and, and it's going weightless? I, I bet you feel it in the pit of your stomach. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it feels like you're about to float off your seat. But interestingly enough, when I was learning the demo, the very first time I did a pushover, I had my belt hooked or my harness hooked like I did in combat, right? And so it was not super tight. So I push over and I fly out of the seat myself, you know? And so, and so then I'm like, oh, you know, and it was, it was, it caught me by surprise. Like I, I expected zero G. I knew that that was coming, but it was like, I flew off the seat to where my feet couldn't reach the rudder pedal. <laughs> so I had to wait for the G's to come um, back on so that I could get back on. But so after that, I can tell you, I was super cinched into my seat so that that didn't happen anymore. And again, like we're, there's so much repetition that, you know, you, you get used to it and, and it's more fun at that point. Like you're like, oh, it's coming. They're going to yell. I'm so excited, you know, and you push over and, and we're, we're trying to catch certain airspeeds, uh, altitudes that the show looks good. And so we're 
going through, you know, all these things of like, okay, I got to push over. I got to hold that G. I got to catch this altitude again. And so I, my mind is running a million miles a minute when I'm trying to do that. So and in the video of you online, you actually do give a safety briefing. Mm-hmm. And it's incredible how much you have to brief. I couldn't remember all that, even if I had a script in front of me. So yeah. it's just really impressive how much you do to brief before flight. Yeah, we do. And, and that time in El Centro when our plane is being worked on and we're in the desert doing, you know, helping out with the jet demo, a lot of times that's, we are sitting in our office going over that brief over and over and over and over and over and over. And I'm sure you've seen some of the uh, videos of us where the person in the right seat is making all of the calls for the person in the left seat. So there's, they're calling out your air altitude, out, uh, air speed, altitude, you know, um, all, all, angle of bank, all of that stuff. So we chair fly with each other. Mark and I did it all the time where he's pretending to call these things out. I'm doing pretending you know to fly and then we swap so that that cadence and stuff gets down so that it's safe when we finally actually get to execute it and did you have a favorite maneuver you liked in the demo i i did like the flat pass um and so that's at you know 320 knots at 40 feet um and so most people are like you know how does this c131 go that fast they don't realize how fast we can go but two like being that close to the ground it just really showcases the size of that that airplane and and the fact that we can get a big girl like that to do some of that stuff is pretty cool what about show sites did you have a favorite show site during your time in the blues so i went to the naval academy and my parents actually live right outside of annapolis and so annapolis was by far my my favorite show and it was like coming home right um and so so that one was really cool cherry point was really cool because again i was stationed there for so long that that was also like a second second home miramar was cool because it's a marine corps base and they have a really cool magtaf demo so i got to watch part of the show which was which was neat and yeah the and the pensacola beach show because you live there you're pensacola's team and doing it over the beach when and you can see the whole you know beach is slammed with people that that was really cool and speaking of people you've had an impact on so many but who during your time in the blue angels had an impact on you do you have anyone that really sticks out uh that left a a lasting impact with you Hmm. that's a great question i don't think anyone's asked me that one before um so there there is a a girl and she was a a victim of sexual assault. And when I was coming to the, it was Virginia beach show, the family reached out to the air boss of the show who reached out to me said, Hey, this little girl is going through a lot. The guy just got convicted. Can you come um, meet with her? And, and generally the blues don't do one on ones like that. We do do, like make a wishes and stuff like that as a team, but one-on-ones is not generally the case, but I ended up actually going to this little girl's house. I met her and her family and we actually still keep in touch today. And they send me Christmas cards and stuff like that. And I sent them birth announcements and that of all, all my kids and stuff. And so being able to see how your impact can help someone heal, can help someone get over some really traumatic events, even if it's just for the 15 minutes that you're spending with them, it it takes their mind off of it. Like that's so cool because, you know, you don't think of yourself as a, as a hero or, or a role model a lot of times, right? Yeah. I joined the military because I wanted to fly. I didn't want to be anybody's, you know, role model. That wasn't my goal. And I was just kind of put in that, in this position and, and to now this little girl is, is a prime example of why that's so important. And, you know, having a a female pilot on the team was so important to her because she hadn't seen one before. Um, And and I got that multiple times over, you know, when I was on the team. And so that that made it really real. So she made a really big impact on me. And like I said, we're still friends with the family. Yeah. Awesome to hear you maintain that relationship so many years later. Uh, Transitioning here to a bit of a difficult topic, you had the privilege of Serving on the team at the same time as Captain Jeff Coos, who we all know was lost in 2016. What is the legacy that Captain Coos has left with you? How do you remember uh, Jeff Coos today? So Jeff and I were very close on the team, um, which was 
kind of cool uh, because we were both Marines. We would commiserate sometimes about the different ways that the Navy operates from the Marine Corps. Him and I both really missed the Marine Corps style of leadership. And so we, we bonded kind of over that. And, and I would say in my life, just the way that he lived, he was an amazing father, an amazing husband, uh, a great Marine. He was, even if he didn't like somebody, which he didn't like everybody, but even if he didn't like you, he was professional, supportive. He was a teammate through and through, and he was a really great time as well. Like anytime we would party, you knew it was going to be a good time if Jeff was there. You know, I, I have a distinct memory of of us dancing at the top of of um, one of the hotels in Vegas, and and he's just like jamming out to Justin Bieber. So it was, it, I had multiple stories of that of him, of him singing Boot Scoot and Boogie at, at karaoke. And every time I hear that song, that's his song, um, you know, or, or at Billy Bob's Honky Tonk in Fort Worth, uh, him and Corey were two-stepping and me and Dusty were, were two-stepping and four of us were I remember smashed into like the world's smallest Uber. And so I have all these like really amazing memories of him that I really tried to reflect on. But I will admit like the time between Memorial Day and June 2nd is is really hard every year. Um, I'm, I think about him a lot. And uh, I, I just try to be a, a good mom in his image and be a good Marine in his image. And, uh, you know, he's definitely someone that I'm going to tell my kids about. We're going to go, you know, to the memorial in Tennessee. And, and if we get out to Durango to go just visit him and, and tell them about, you know, this great guy that made an impact on my life. And following Jeff's passing, Fat Albert had the mission of returning Captain Coos back to Pensacola I assume that this had to be an extremely hard mission for you, given the personal circumstances, uh, and yet still having to maintain your professionalism to execute the mission. How hard was it to to bring Jeff home? So um, this sounds, it sounds almost impersonal, but I did a lot of angel flights when I was in country. So it, it was, it was not that I was numb to them because obviously it being a friend of yours instead of a stranger is different. But I knew the impact that angel flights have on families and friends when you do it, a dignified transfer, how much, how much they appreciate it. And so I had, as much as I was hurting, his wife, Christina, was hurting worse. His, his parents were hurting worse. His children were hurting worse. And so I needed to compartmentalize my feelings for them, right? And so the day Jeff died, we actually flew his family back to Pensacola because his remains had to get processed. And then we came back, got his remains, flew them to Dover where they got processed. Then we got him from Dover, flew him down to Pensacola where we picked up his family. Um, and then we flew from Pensacola to Durango. And I remember when we landed in Durango, we let his mom actually go up the hatch in the front and she was waving to everyone who was, who lined the, runway for Jeff when we came back and she came down and after the flight was over and we'd shut down she and this was I was in one and so um she looked at me and said like the time that I was waving to everybody with my head out was the first time that I felt good since he died even if it was for like two seconds you know it she said it was the first time that that I felt good and so to be able to give that to Mama Coos you know, was, was great. And, and, you know, we had a really good time at his wake. That sounds kind of crass, but, but he would have loved that. He would have loved that it was a party and, and, you know, we, we drank in his honor and we made toast to him and, and thought of memories of him. And then he had a really beautiful ceremony where he was buried back in his hometown of Durango. And then, you know, we, we also had a memorial service in Pensacola, but yeah, it was, it was difficult to compartmentalize, but it was such a honor to be able to give that to his family and to give that to Jeff that, you know, it, it'll be a memory that I cherish. 
And as your time wound down on the Blue Angels, how are you feeling? I know a lot of Blue Angels or former Blue Angels I've interviewed on this channel told me that by the time their tenure was up on the Blue Angels, they were ready for their next military assignment. They were ready to go back to the fleet. How were you, how were you feeling when you got the end of your time on the Blue Angels? I was ready to move on as well. I think the between Jeff and I had some major life changes at the time, and it was just I missed the Marine Corps. <laughs> I, I know that's weird to say, but, um, and, and I kind of alluded to it before, there's just a different decision-making process between Marines and, and Navy leadership. There's different cultures, and not that either one is better than the other. It's just, I was raised in the Marine Corps culture, and that's why I joined that service, and, and I missed that. I missed that and so it was it was great to be able to go back and do that. And I actually went on to a tour where I was a company commander after I was done with the Blues. So I was leading, you know, 130 Marines and get it, it thrown in the deep end of leadership, if you will. And so it was um, it was a great, rewarding tour. And I was really excited about it as I was leaving the Blues. So I, that made it made the transition away from the team easier. Are you retired from the Marine Corps now uh, as a major? Is that correct or no? No, I actually am a reservist now. So I am not active duty. So I do the one week in a month, two weeks a year kind of thing. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I couldn't, I couldn't completely leave my beloved Corps. So I, I still, still am a reservist. And do you still follow the Blue Angels and happenings with Fat Albert? Uh, have you been seeing the the new transition to the J model, which you mentioned earlier that you've flown? Uh, what do you think about the new paint job? Those digital displays look pretty awesome from uh, an outsider looking in. But what are your thoughts about the new Fat Albert? Yeah, so that is a J model, exactly the same airplane that, that we fly in the fleet. It's just like a lot more Gucci paint job, like you said. Um, I have been following it. The current M1 is really great about e emailing prior Fat Albert pilots and to keep us kind of all in the loop. We actually saw the paint scheme before it came out to the public. Um, and so I think it's I think it's good. I think it's good that he, that they deviated from previous because she is a new airframe. And so being able to start over with this new cool paint job and a new new airframe, they're going to have to develop a new demo or at least they, uh, they're they going to have to adjust it for the new parameters of this airplane. Um, and so I think it's a chapter. It's a new chapter. So it makes sense to kind of have him send out, you know, these changes that we're doing. And, and you know, she looks great. She's going to do great in the, in the demo. I hope they get a demo. That's my, I, I haven't heard otherwise. I hope they do. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a challenge for those that are on the team developing it. But I mean, the demo for the T model, previous Fat Albert was developed from scratch. So they should be able to do it with this J model too. So really looking forward to it. Nice. And, and before we go here, you have been making some media appearances uh, as a way on <laughs> my primetime television. Uh, I don't know if I'm ashamed to admit this or not, but one of my guilty pleasures is watching The Bachelor and yeah. uh, saw you on there. I thought it was absolutely hysterical. Um, and then you've also I have two young kids and they love, uh, you know, I think Ryan's it, mystery play date. there you go and so yep. uh it, it was so cute seeing you on there as well so is that a career path for you as well getting into the entertainment industry or um just are these just fun things that just kind of circumstantially came up yeah no so no no goal to be in the entertainment industry they they do just kind of pop up i have a pretty large social media presence um and you know they're when it comes to famous female pilots. I mean, most people can name like Amelia Earhart, but there's not, there's not really many of us. Right. And so, um, both times it was from somebody Googling female pilot and my name coming up and then they find me on Instagram and they're like, Oh, this is cool. And then they ask me, so that that's how it came out both times. And so, um, yeah, they're just kind of spontaneous. Uh, and, and I do that. I actually work for a tech company as my real job. Um, and so I, I, I've been, I've been doing that. I'm on maternity leave right now because we just had our third baby, but, um, but yeah, so, so I work for a tech company. I do some motivational speaking on the side too, mostly about succeeding as a woman in kind of a man's world, but also do kind of just basic leadership talks. So Dusty and I have started our uh, kind of a small business doing that. And then, you know, I do the entertainment industry stuff whenever it comes up. So kind of a jack of all trades right now. Yeah, sounds like it. And if someone wanted to book you or Dusty for your leadership program, where or how can they get in contact with you to do that? 
Yep. So you can go to the kdncook.com. Um, and, you know, we have a, a, the ability to just send us a note with a request of, of when you want us to come speak. Um, and, and we can, we'll answer you back, you know, within a couple of business days. We do have three under three right now. So <laughs> it might be a little bit delayed, um, but we try to get back to you as fast as possible. Well, Major Cook, this has been an awesome conversation. Thanks for being so candid today. And I know I definitely enjoyed it. And I know the audience is going to enjoy it as well. So thank you so much. Sure thing. Thanks so much for having me. And, and thanks for spotlighting the blues in the way that you do. There's, there's sometimes some bad media and bad press out there. But, uh, it, you know, reminding people how important it is to bring attention to our, our Navy and Marine Corps team that's deployed via the Blue Angels. Um, is is really important. So thank you for contributing to that mission. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, obviously I love doing what I do here and enjoy the history of the Blue Angels. And it's incredible the legacy the team has, 75 years and going strong. So uh, I think that speaks to the value that the Blues and even the Thunderbirds bring uh, to our country and, and always thinking of those that are deployed overseas. So thanks again, Major Cook. This has really been an honor. Sure thing. Thank you. Special thanks to Major Katie Cook for being a guest on the Blue Angel Phantoms podcast. I absolutely loved having that conversation. She's an amazing human being. Now, I wanted to give you guys a heads up and draw your attention to an event I'm excited about. I'm not affiliated with it anyway, but if you like the content on my channel, then you may like this event as well. It's being organized by the Blue Angels Foundation, which is the charitable arm of the Blue Angels Association. It's a group of former Blue Angels getting together with the mission of supporting wounded veterans. The event they're organizing is going to be a virtual event, and it's going to take place on November 11th, and they're going to have a lot of guest speakers, music, and so much more. So really looking forward to that. And the best way to keep up to date with the event and learn more of the details is follow them on their social media channels. So just go on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook and follow the Blue Angels Foundation. They also have a website, blueangelsfoundation.org, and they have an amazing documentary on there. It's only nine minutes long, but it really drives home the impact that the Blue Angels Foundation is making. Now, if you want to support the Blue Angels Foundation today, you can actually text BAF to 91999 and you can make a donation today again i am not directly affiliated with this organization in any way but i think they do wonderful work and i'm happy to support them in any way i can so until next time thank you so much for listening to the podcast i'm looking forward to doing more of these take care of yourself and we'll talk real soon